Good evening, everybody. Can I have your attention, please? I hope you can hear me. Um, if not, I'll use the microphone, but welcome. I am David Kratz. I'm the president and a graduate of the New York Academy of Art, and I'm super thrilled to have this packed house tonight for uh, Lori Simmons and Chloe Wise. Um, it's great to introduce people who don't need an introduction, and I definitely put Lori in that category. She is an artist, a photographer, a filmmaker, and also a great friend of the New York Academy of Art. Um, she came up as part of the Pictures Generation, a group of artists who include also Cindy Sherman, Barbara Kruger, Lori Lawler, um, uh, Louise Lawler, sorry. And you all know her work. Much of it concerns the role of women in society. And I'll just say she's, I hate it when people do those long lists of where everybody's everywhere showing and, or exhibited or whatever. So I'll just say she's in permanent collections in museums across the globe and has had too many solo shows and even retrospectives to list them all. So that's Lori. Um, also is Chloe Wise, who is a Canadian artist based in New York. She works in, sculptor, in sculpture, oil painting, drawing, and video art, and that puts her squarely in the wheelhouse of um, all things we do here at the New York Academy of Art. She's also one of the most watched young figurative artists um, on the scene these days, which again puts her even more in our wheelhouse, and we're just delighted that you're here, Chloe. Um, one of the things I like best about her work is um, the humor and uh, she uses comedy and satire to critique consumer culture and commercialization and mixes it deftly with art historical references too, again, which puts her in our world. Um, when I went to see your show at the Journal Gallery, which is one of my favorite galleries, I just went home and thought, I should go to the dentist because, <laughs> because of that. Like, well, you, maybe you can tell them more about that, but anyway. Um, what, <laughs> okay, so um, let's start them off with a big round of applause and uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to them for their conversation. Hi. Hi, Chloe. Hi, Lori. Um, so Chloe and I came up with this plan where we were just going to write um, down a bunch of questions that we would ask each other if we were going out to dinner, which we've been threatening to do for a while. Um, and um, my grandmother always used to say age before beauty. I never knew what that meant, but I think it means I'm supposed to ask the first question, which I will. <laughs> um, this is like a Passover Seder. That yes. would be the inverse if that was the... Yeah. Okay. The, four que the ten questions. So when I first came to New York, interesting artists did everything except paint. In fact, I felt sorry for my friends who were painters, particularly the women. It was kind of embarrassing. And um, my boyfriend was a painter, and my friends used to say, my, my boyfriend is still here in the, in the front row, but <laughs> my friends used to say, we like Carol's work, but he's not really a painter. And when I told him that, he said, well, I use paints and a brush on canvas, so what do you think I'm doing? So there was this sort of desire to... Um, well, painting was dead, again, you know, one, one more time in history, painting was declared dead. But I want to know how you got to painting. That's such an interesting um, way to begin it, because the idea that uh, somebody who uses paint and a paintbrush and a canvas would even in that moment argue or have somebody classify them not as a painter is such an interesting, then you'd have to start by framing what is painting, which I don't intend to do. but. Um, I don't think I really had a choice. I don't think I, there was no primacy of education or dialogue around what contemporary art can or can't be, how alive or dead painting is when I came to painting. I was a kid and I was, it's something I was automatically drawn to. Um, I wonder if you agree, if when you're just drawn to image making and composition and color and beauty and the creation of that, which probably has to do with whether your parents inspired you or encouraged you to do that as a child. but. For me, that was just, I woke up in my late teens and I had been already doing this. This is something that, I'm, that I natively do, is draw and paint. Um, but when I moved to New York after going to art school in Canada, I was met with that same assumption that maybe it's embarrassing to paint. 
or maybe painting is dead unless it's mediated through the digital. Um, and so there was, a, there was a moment where, when I moved to New York, I was trying to do everything but paint. My first two solo shows had no paintings in them except for printed onto canvas paintings, which I think goes to that. Um, is it painting? I don't know, it's on a wall. Um, but pretty quickly I realized that that was disingenuous to what my interests are. They are far and wide and they span many kinds of media, but painting is very much the first as a primacy. It seems like the core of what you do very much, that everything emanates from your painting. And it's interesting, the point you bring up, because I think most people come to art because they can draw and paint when they were little. And so, um, and I was a printmaking major at art school and a, and a sculpture minor, because we had to declare what we were. I never picked up a camera until I got to New York and discovered conceptual art, which was being documented by a camera. But it, you know, it's an interesting moment when you realize just because you can draw and paint and um, you have a kind of facility that that facility doesn't really matter, that it's, you know, it's what's in your mind and your ideas that matter. This is what happens to most young artists when they come to a city and decide to start, um, to start having their grown-up life, life as an artist. But I, I thought when you came that painting really was happening in New York, I mean, like when you started? I moved here in 2012 or 13, mm -hmm. and I came straight into um, a post-internet sort of place. Mm -hmm. Of course, painting was happening. It wasn't completely um, dominated by the ideology of like a Clement Greenberg sort of thing. I say, <laughs> okay. Um, art handling, too, is one of my... Um, but I think the the work I was interested and interested in and the artists I was interested in, um, simultaneously I was interested in painting, but the art and media I was looking at didn't necessarily interact with or, or um, complement the way I liked to paint, the things I had learned about painting. In school I learned how to paint and I also learned how to unlearn painting and throw your canvas on the ground and run over it with a car and put your oil paint underwater but I'm also learning the skills needed to paint. So it was confusing, and I think most people didn't really think about a career as such or a body of work that would expand past painting. And I was painting, but I was also learning and finding myself interested in, in art in the larger sense, media in the larger sense, and so I didn't see there being a way I could make the two make sense except, and unless I used irony or like my, I think Jeannie actually showed one of my really early paintings. It's like spray paint. I mean, don't look it up. <laughs> but I was thinking through sculpture and thinking through video and painting, but not very confident in the idea of showing figurative painting. But when I realized that what I like to do is figurative painting and I sort of let myself do it, I found there was a way, or at least I'm trying to find a way, and I was then and I am now, to find humor in painting that's aware of itself as painting. It's so um, interesting that you bring up humor because I've always resisted that interpretation. I always felt like, oh my God, it's gonna diminish the work so much if people laugh or think it's funny. And your wholehearted embrace of that is something that I really admire. You're pretty unapologetic about it, that's I think. That's so interesting that you said that you don't feel that way though. No. So I finished your question, but then I, I need to know more about that one because but I have another question for you. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I just want to know, before I forget, you arrived at this very consistently dark palette. At least that's the way I see it. Where does that come from? You mean I arrived there recently? No. In your, your, the general overview of your painting, I feel like color-wise, palette-wise, is extremely dark to me. Where did that come from? I thank you. I don't know if that's. I don't an, mean dark. A, no, like, like dark. I, you mean like tonally? Dark, dark. Tonally. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean color-wise, it's very dark. To I, me. I want to say thank you because I've been trying to um, um, hold it back a bit because I look back at some of my earlier work, and I know it's funny to say early work. We're talking about four years, five years ago. That is funny. Maybe eight. <laughs> maybe eight at, at times, but as yeah. as being over abundant or over ambitious in the use of color, mm -hmm. and I think one of the main things I've learned that I'm happy to share and have learned and that I am interested in continuing to, um, to mine for new information is the idea of 
holding back because I'm a maximalist in every way. And so if I have access to many colors, which I do, I'll probably end up using the entirety of the rainbow. But using less to say more has been my sort of my, my endeavor in the last few years. So thank you for thinking my palette is dark. I don't know if it is, but I have removed the color white from my palette. Well, it is, it is a you know, in terms of what it could be, a murkier, darker palette than a lot of painting. It, it's interesting to me because up until my mother died, she would tell everyone how I only used the, the black and brown crayons. And my parents decided that I was a depressed child because <laughs> I, I wouldn't use the bright colors. So there, you know, we attribute so much to color and, and people's use of color and, um, and their, their internal life, their, my mom would have said that you were a chic child because she was she did not condone too much colorfulness, <laughs> whether it was in her color palette, how she dressed, or how she we would we would color together all the time, and I was very much encouraged by her. But it's funny that um, that would insinuate, of course, that would insinuate a depressed child, perhaps. But I think it shows nice taste. She likes navy, black, and brown. Those for, are <laughs> yeah, for, yeah. Those were my crayons. Um, okay. You want to ask a question? Yeah, well, um, I had a question, but I have to, what you said about humor. So you resist the interpretation or the perception of humor in your work or in the work of others because no, no, you're a in very my funny own, husband. In my own, my husband's funny? His work is funny <laughs> in ways. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I think the work has a humor to it that's yeah. not its entirety, but I, I think, think there's a tone you can't ignore, and maybe it's, it's not one note laugh out loud funny, but there's a, I mean, we have to define funny. There's carnivalesque humor or you know, judgmental humor or... Um... Yeah. Well, I think, I think humor, I think, you know, so much is based on when we, when we started to be grown-up artists and what we saw at the time. And I think that when we came of age, the work was so serious and so door and so, um, um, well, conceptual process, you know, the kind of art that was going on. And there, the art that was humorous was, seemed a little bit lighter and less serious, and humor uh, was often associated with a lack of seriousness. Do you still see that? Um, or how did that change since you first came into that art world and how things have How has it changed? Yeah. I think there's a lot of work that em embraces humor, that has a kind of hum humorous or ironic edge, but I still got really uncomfortable if, I remember when I made my first film and I had no, it, it, no, it was a puppet musical. And just the sound of a puppet musical could make you laugh. <laughs> but when the audience laughed um, for the first time, the first time I showed it publicly and when they laughed at the first act, I, I just started sinking in my chair. It just never occurred to me that the singing puppets would be construed as humorous. That's so interesting. I know that sounds dis <laughs> I know that sounds disingenuous, but with, within the scope, within the range and scope of what I do, I always go for the most realism possible and the most seriousness possible. So I want the puppets to make you cry. But that's that that is the beauty. It's seriously funny, and the funniest things are not the silliest and most vacuous things. Right. But they're the things that make you see an ounce of truth. And yeah. that, you know, um, over-exaggerate or underline uh, something so tragic or so abject that they are worth laughing about. And so I don't mean, I don't think your work is funny, funny. I think it's, there's an, <laughs> there's a, the abject, too. yeah, we'll, we'll talk later. <laughs> um, but the abject, I think, you know, when we say funny, we're simplifying something that, of course, could take on many forms. And the abject is, I think, one of the highest um, highest ways of delving into any subject matter is to find the part that is, I mean, I, would, I, feel, I feel horrible if my work's not funny. I feel so self-serious. And if it's funny, there's multiple ways in which it could be perceived as funny. I wouldn't like the feeling of sinking in a chair when someone's laughing at the wrong time. I'd feel like I'm well, being laughed at. Well, I didn't expect at. any laughter. I think that's the point, right. none. That's interesting. I mean, when um, I have film, when I show video work and I hear laughing out loud, I am so excited. Yeah because I, I feel that, I guess I assume of my audience that we, us, we are laughing at the same thing or at this, having discomfort at the same-ish time. So there's a, there's a, there's a judgment that's, um, that comes before, like a preconceived judgment that I would be finding myself in the same, with the same sense of humor as those that I'm showing this work to. But I guess if you're, if you're surrounded by very self-serious, formalist, minimalist 
color field painters. I don't know if they, yeah, if you'd well, like I them to laugh. That, well, I think what we're both saying in our own way is that humor is a portal, and it's a way to, um, it's a way to find something. It's a way to get somewhere. It's a way to, to draw people in um, on, on one level. And, you know, you snare them, you draw them in, you hook them with the humor, and then the rest of the stuff that's in your work and my work, then they'll find it. I mean, that's how I've come to think about it. So you have come to think about humor as something you accept or welcome? Yeah. Okay. Not welcome. Not welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but accept. Okay. Accept. Okay, interesting. Because one of my questions was going to be, um, is, there a, is there a common or not so common, but a misconception or a misreading of your work that will, will at once make you understand that you've been misunderstood or that your work has been understood in a way that you did not intend it? And if it's laugh out loud funny, that would be... Well, I think that um, I feel chronically misunderstood, but I think that's part of being an artist. I mean, well, I think that, you know, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm so misunderstood. Um, but we all, you know, that's, that's part of what keeps us going. This time, I'm, this time I'm going to shock you, but you're not going to understand it, but you're going to love me, but you're also going to hate it. I mean, there's just so, you know, making work just brings up so many conflicts. Um, um, so many things that we have to do to keep ourselves going as artists, I think, these sort of, you know, cross currents of um, feeling and desire and demands on our viewers, whoever they may be. But Ooh. now you, I'm just, just to make sure. Yeah. If I were to say that I found something funny, which I don't necessarily in your work, at this <laughs> point you would, you would be open to that reading, not as an insult, but as... I wouldn't sink in my chair. Okay, okay, <laughs> cool. Um, but. I think humor no. is a very important, maybe crutch, maybe tool, maybe portal, definitely portal. But I think it allows, I mean, I think about the way that humor, or laughter rather, is an impulse or um, it's a, we don't have the choice when it happens, just like a yawn or mm -hmm. a sneeze. Mm -hmm. And it's something contagious and it's something that has a function, but it doesn't, it's not an obvious function the way that other evolutionary functions are. And when you think about what it does do, it creates empathy, it joins people, it dissipates violence or potential violence. And so it's obviously a very necessary human need and it's, it evades language. I mean, that's incredible. It's so interesting what and, you're saying. And also we can identify when a laugh is hollow and fake. And I think that that's very significant as yeah, well. And more, there's so many versions of a laugh or versions mm -hmm. of a smile. And you know, there's a lot of smiles I can see out of the corner of my eye going on here because it's something I think about frequently, but you know, the artifice of a smile or of a laugh, the way that we write LOL when we're not laughing or moving even at all. I love all, LOL. I have just, to say oh, well. it's so, it's highly useful, lots very of, functional. Lots of love. Yeah. But um, I, yeah, it's functional, but no, it's- No, laugh out loud. I know, I'm joking. Oh. <laughs> that's funny. Thank you, okay. Um. But I do think it's important, so it's interesting to hear. I mean, I can't imagine existing in a moment where that wasn't one of the main um, features I attempted to use as a communication strategy to know that I've been understood is if someone laughs um, even at something that's not got a punchline but rather just has a sense overall of discomfort or or humor so it's inter I just can't imagine what that must have been like I think laughing just wasn't in style when I came to New York <laughs> it just was you know there was very little laughing but okay Who's, who asks a question? Um, well, I, I just asked you one about okay. humor. I have, I have one for okay. you. Okay. So we share an interest in food as imagery and clearly an interest in food in general and health in general. And food can be a very fraught subject for women. Is food friend or foe? Friend, best friend. Good, good answer. <laughs> good answer. All I do when I'm not painting is cook. Oh. Yeah, it's really not from a place of, I think that we both, I think, use food and that kind of imagery in some similar ways mm -hmm. as it can be compared to the consumable female figure or mm -hmm. the way it's advertised right, exactly. pornographically. And right. I think, I mean, I, I think it almost goes without saying, and I'm not sure if it's a topic we, although, oh, look yeah. at him, okay. Her. Ooh, the shoes. Her. Okay, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But I, I, um, I mean, there's so many obvious ways to talk about food as, it, as an image or as a form or as a vessel for meaning. And there's also the fact that on, its, on the most simple level, we all need it. I love it. I'm really good at making it and eating it. And it's a beautiful, visual, organic, often um, thing to represent. And it also, so, some of the food 
work, some of the food work I've done, <laughs> um, some of the sculptures that are hyper-realistic um, and representations of food. It's not just of the food itself, but usually a food that has a more uh, sticky signification. So the Caesar salad, for example, I mean, it can bring up a lot of different ideas. I think it's often associated with Italian food. It was actually invented in Tijuana, but it was co-opted by a, like Italian American restaurants such as Olive Garden in a way mm -hmm. that signifies right. real Italian. But th I love the layers there of meaning and of of credit. Who gets credit for what? Who, what it reminds you of? You know, there's a deconstructed Caesar salad that you'll get at a fancy restaurant that knows that it's a gimmick when you get it at the at the American Italian restaurant. So it's done a it's done a revamp of something because it knows you're in on the joke that if you deconstructed the salad, you're of a higher taste level. And then there's the you know the Caesar salad chicken wrap at the gas station. But to me, it's like the idea that just like a chandelier, this food can bring up so many different um, lines of thought or significations or memories or um, correlations to people. And so it becomes a perfect vessel to make jokes or represent. Yes, um, and it, it can be very fraught, obviously, there, and particularly for women, um, women in eating, eating disorders. I feel like I came of age in the first generation of women that were exhibiting, exhibiting eating disorders. Um, like, you know, I, I remember when I learned about anorexia and then it was sort of everywhere. So there's that aspect of it. And then there's also, I rarely talk about the fact that I'm Jewish or a Jewish artist, but we both share that, and I wonder if there's something, I mean, I wonder if there's something in our background about food. <laughs> That's hardly a question, but there is something in our background where food and love are really um, equated. Love language, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. My mother always was telling me she loved me through the amount of food she was forcing on me. Yeah. I don't mean that in a negative way. I, I mean offering. It's just the generosity. Yes. And, it's, and, it's, and it is a way of It's my love showing. language now. Yeah. Hmm? It's absolutely my love language too. So it's, yeah. for me it's not really about, I, I know there exists and I do refer to or, or admit to and reference the fraught relationship mm -hmm. or expectations I and so on. I think you do very much. Yeah. I do, but for me it's more the fact that food can do all of those things. It's mm -hmm. not really about its relationship to women and eating as much as it's about the relationship to food as something that can be consumed and is advertised to you as desirable and women that are advertised to you as desirable and can be consumed or the fleetingness of you know, the freshness or youth or desirability of both, the memento mm -hmm. mori, which is such an obvious subject to bring up in right. a, you know, in a painting it. school, but um, it's not really about the fraughtness. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I remember when I made a, um, a tomato on legs as part of the Walking Object series, and when I was young, a really hot woman was referred to as a tomato. But people don't really know that now. Wait, can, you, can you elaborate on that? Well, <laughs> she's, it, it actually probably was more maybe my parents' generation kind of Kind of moving into my generation. But was but it one really hot woman that everyone called tomato? No. Or like a general. <laughs> you really don't know this. No. Okay. <laughs> Someone would say, like some gangster kind of guy would say, she's a really hot tomato. Like that. Meaning she's. Has anyone ever heard that? No, I'm like hot potato? <laughs> okay. okay hot tomato, tomato, not potato. Tomato. Like a cooked, like a sun drop, like cooked? No. <laughs> we need help from me. <laughs> it was a thing. It was just a thing, like saying some, what's another way, what's another... Maybe enough people in this room to make it a thing again. A dish, dish. exactly. Dish. She's a real dish. Have you heard that one? Yeah. Okay, so it's like... <laughs> yeah. Okay. But I realized when I made the tomato on woman's legs that no, you know, very, like you, very few people got the reference. Even better. Even better. Even better. But the one other thing about food is that it also, and especially the abundance in your work and the dripping and the whatever, um, makes me think about food insecurity and the luxury of food and um, the idea that things that are healthy are not available to everyone. And it, you know, it's it's a it's a obviously we both like it because it's a very broad topic. With and I love that you say food is part of your. Um, love language, because I feel that way too. But food insecurity, I mean, of course, yeah. you know, it's, the, it's the, the banality of walking into a grocery store for us. Mm -hmm. It's the, in America, it's the overabundance, the waste, 
the, the ridiculous extent to which we have variations of everything, it's perverse. And of course, built into that is the understanding and assumption and knowledge that that's not the same universally, that globally there's all kinds of food mm -hmm. insecurity, of course, and that's what makes it so much more perverse in a way. Right. And when you think about the Dutch still life, of course, those paintings were intended to show abundant luxury and ostentatious spreads of, look what I have, assuming that you have not, especially. Right. So of course that's built in, mm -hmm. is that understanding? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, whose turn? Um, <laughs> me. Um, okay, your work uses archetypal tropes such as domestic female labor in suburbia, fashion, um, and a lot of imagery that we can point to that could but resists nostalgia. Um, of course, a lot of your work spans many time periods, so it depends on at what point you are making what work, but I see in your work a past without necessarily, a retroness without a nostalgia. I see a zeitgeist at times that refers to the present, and I see a potential futuristic, dystopian um, use of, not necessarily in these works, but the use of um, alterations, modifications, and you know, um, online communities where people uh, use technology in different ways, cosmetic or otherwise, to alter their, in a way that's futuristic, in, in a sense, to me. And so I'm thinking about the temporal placement of your work. Do you see those three times past, present, and future as in dialogue? And, or is, it, is there an ahistoricalness, ahistoricity? Or, and who wins if those three are in dialogue? I really feel like I want you to just keep talking because you're getting it so right. <laughs> <laughs> I could just and I kind of like, love it. I accidentally wrote like almost an entire essay about your Which work, I would really I would love. So <laughs> to sit and just have you read it. So. I mean, it's not in any in any you know um, cohesive form. But I was being all like a beautiful mind, like writing, like <laughs> all crazy because I have. There's so much that your work brings up for me, and it's so um, interesting, especially considering the years in which these these works were made. I think I'm looking at some work that was made, you know, in in the 90s, and some work that's made as recently as five years ago or more, and. Um, some of the work that's earlier seems to warn or speak of a future that I guess we're in right now. And it's a not so distant future, mm -hmm. which I think is even more uncanny or eerie than speaking about, you know, in a sci-fi way, uh, a far off future. It's not warning of, you know, global climate change crisis. It's warning of something much more, not that that's not near, but something much nearer. And I think that there's something so subtle and insidious there but I don't necessarily, like these works especially, but I don't necessarily see it as, as extremely nostalgic or extremely futuristic, but nor is it extremely present. So I, I mean, I'm, that's my take. I don't, I can't quite place, especially because these are works made over um, a period of time. Many, 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 many years. But when you are <laughs> making the work or, or when you're looking at the work, and obviously there's so many works to be discussed yeah. here, but do you have a, a, uh, an intention temporally? Well, I love the idea that past, present, and future collapse, and that would be something that I would aspire towards. Um, I understand nostalgia has become kind of a dirty word. Um, that's what I discovered in teaching, that it was, you know, if, if works, and I've only taught really in, in um, you know, where people make photo-based works, but nostalgia was always sort of a negative critique um, but I, I always feel like I'm 20 years out of date with my subject matter. So if I made my first, let, let, let me say, my, I feel like I made my first mature grown-up work in 1976 when I was, do I, if I tell you how old I was, you're going to do the math, but that's okay. I was 26 years old, and I felt like I knew when I made my first, like this photo is the beginning. I knew it. And I felt like I was on a train and there would be no way to get off. And that's been true. But um, in those first photos, I was going over my childhood, which was basically around 20 years before that. So I feel like, for instance, when I made my tourism pictures, I was addressing um, my first, my, the first time that I was able, the first times that I was able to travel abroad and what those experiences felt like. So I feel like I've always been um, many years out of, like I'm way out ahead of what I'm, okay, how can I say this? 
I'm making work about the past in some way, but trying to make it feel like it's in the present. Um, I feel like I'm finally here, be here now. I feel like I'm finally here making work in the present about the present moment, but it's taken a really long time. But I think I'm going to sort of play around with the idea of, I love what you said about collapsing all of those time periods. Um, into, into one moment. I like that a lot, so thank you for that. <laughs> I'm interested also in how nostalgia is a dirty word, and I mean, if, this, if the uh, assignment here was questions we would ask each other at a dinner party, my mm. favorite question that I'm gonna have to ask you is, what is the opposite of nostalgia? Take a second. Because there's not a right answer, so I'm not quizzing you. Yeah, but is, <laughs> like, is there what, an answer? Yeah, well, there, there can be many, but I mean, I think it would start with defining nostalgia. Um, well, nostalgia was actually, def was actually defined, um, I, I don't know if it was during World War I or World War II, it was actually um, a psychological condition. Um, I, wish I, had, I wish I had this at my fingertips, but it was something about, it had to do with soldiers and PTSD. When I was doing, and I, I honestly, if anyone knows, let me know now, because if I go any deeper, does anyone know? <laughs> The desire, desire to return to your country, not because it's the return. The desire to return to It's two words, it's algos, which means suffering, and nostos, which means the return. It's like a malicious kind of uh, original, the etymological speech. Mm -hmm. that's, right. that's wonderful. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm big on... Um, being anywhere at any time and hearing a word and needing to know the etymology now. Yeah. But I, and that's very, very useful and obviously true. But in addition to that... Combined with food, no, uh, no stimulant is something that's very tasteful. So like the repair to where you originally come from. And there's also nos in it, at, which is also us or new. Was there some sort of connection there? I mean, it has to do with like a belonging or, but I think in addition to that, there's also the idea of nostalgia. There's a physical, the nostalgia of that era or like nostalgia like paraphernalia. There's also nostalgic, which if it was a dirty term in school, in terms of, you know, as a, as a descriptor for film or art or photography, would seem to mean wistful and longing for a past of a certain, in a certain positive way. There's also a negative association that has to do with, you know, there's, there's, there's multiple ways of reading it. So it I- It might have overlapped with camp a little bit. Sure. Which is why- it The became, retro. Yeah, with retro, which is why it became confused in that but, way. But, but depending on how you define it, I think it's then very hard. It also produces a much different response to the question, what's the opposite of nostalgia? So what is? I don't know. What do you think it is? There's a, I have a, I've asked rooms of 10 people and gotten an amazing array of answers. Boy, that's I have, a great, I wish my dinner party questions were that. Well, it's a great, it's a great, we can, <laughs> what, I would love to know if you have a, you can think about it, we can come back to it. But Yeah, it's no, a, it's a really, it's really a interesting one. question, yeah. Because if, if you define it as that, which is the longing to return to, in a PTSD way, or in a longing to return to mm -hmm. your country post-war, then the opposite of nostalgia would be peace, what or I, yeah. unmovingness, but that's right. not the same or as... Right, or home. Or home, yeah. but that's not the same as what we are... No. Or, or running from home, I mean, I don't, like, needing to be free. So that's not the same as the kind of nostalgia that would refer to a, a way of describing a kind of... Um, a kind of aesthetic value of something that looks as though it prefers an old timey or if you know if you made a, a film now that was aiming to reproduce 1950s aesthetics in a way that sung that song of 1950s as though it was a perfect time that would in a way be nostalgic so the opposite would be what sci-fi futuristicness or it would yeah, it be but that's even got a you know the the, the sci-fi that we watched when we were little kids my generation looks camp and nostalgic now. It was no. like Flash Gordon and all of these sort of, you know, um, lightning bolts on your clothes and big shoulders sticking out and rocket ships and things that would look so nostalgic. Well, so funny to think about the idea of, of looking at images as nostalgic, futuristic. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> we can move on. Okay. Whose turn? Uh, yours. Oh. Um, Gosh, we already answered how do you feel about people saying your work is funny. 
Um, okay, I'm just going to go into a completely different territory. Have you been thinking about AI and art? Yeah. What do you think? Um, I've been using Dolly and a few other ones, Wonder. I just downloaded another one that I paid for in the App Store. That's how much I... $40 a year is how much I care about AI in, in art. <laughs> I've seen, I've seen your, your there, it's, it's beautiful. It's so interesting. Um, okay, well, you ask me and then I'll ask you. Uh, I've been thinking about it quite a lot. I've been using it a lot. I think it's funny because on one hand, I, I am in awe of it completely taken by what it produces, especially because I think I'm really good at writing the prompts, which yeah. is, which it becomes a funny thing because I'm so, I'm, I end up being proud of this thing. And then I realize the whole question that we're going to have to contend with is authorship and whether artists will be obviously replaced by that, no, but whether the thing that is produced by the AI prompt that you wrote is in fact your work I mean, when I first got Dali, they gave me this whole, because I got it really early, they gave me this whole um, warning that technically anything I produce is also is their property. And I was like, okay, I, I mean, I'm not going to do anything it's with this, but anymore, not anymore. Not anymore. But yeah. that was an interesting moment, mm -hmm. which, which, I mean, that plus just the technology in general, you know, begs the question of authorship and maybe, uh, maybe the loss of it. But then my instinct was to be proud of the work and, and, I actually hoard it in folders on my phone. Once I figure out what to do with it, I can't wait to release it. But right. in, in the meantime, I can't think of anything better to do than to post it online. And that feels boring. It's almost like telling someone your dreams, where it's like, look at this thing that I had AI do. And it, it's like, OK, I mean, pass me the AI. I'll well, do it. Well, if you do hashtag AI on your Instagram, there's, there's like you know, 7 million. I know, but they're bad. That's why artists Mine are do. good. Yours are good. <laughs> Mine are good. I'm sure a lot of people in this room are good, but the, the vast majority is like a cat as a superhero astronaut on Mars made yeah. of soup or whatever. The yeah. reoccurring theme is, you know yeah. that's accurate, by the way. And it's so, it's just this, it's this, it's a deviant art that is way less cool than deviant art is. Do you know the reference I'm making? Like that, it's, it's an aesthetic of of illustration in a way that's worse than illustration. But the, the other way of looking at it is so, there's some amazing art projects that are, that are coming from it, but I, as a person who lives in the physical, quite traditional um, mediums, I don't know how to incorporate that. Of course, I've considered painting them, but, and someone's going to, slash probably is already, but I don't know if... That's, that's so interesting, because when I first made mine, um, when I started making them, and I was so excited. I decided right away that I was an AI whisperer. <laughs> they get me. They yeah. really get me. Um, well, you are really, I, I think that you've made some of the images I've seen that you've created feel like they are part of you. I think that's they're, so They're incredible. my work. Yeah. But some, it's interesting because some days, and I love it because I've gotten really lazy and I can do it lying down. Which is Wait, as opposed to what? <laughs> as opposed to standing up in front of my camera and making a setup, I can just, I can do it Wait, later. AI, which AI well, are you talking about? Dolly, I can do, I oh. mean, I can lie down and Wait, have okay, my as computer. opposed to making, I thought you were like doing AI sort of standing up. Like, no, no, got no, it, as go opposed on. to being in my studio and actually making photography, okay, yeah. doing things, but you just, you know, give your prompts and stuff mm -hmm. and these things are coming out that look like they're things that I would make. But when I first um, showed them to my friend, Marilyn Minter, she said, these look like really bad imitations of your work. And I said, no, they are my work. And she said, I think you should take these and set them up in your studio, copy them and shoot them. <laughs> I said, that's so much work. That's, yeah, but I think in a way the, that's... The, the beauty, the, the, the ease, the amazingness of, 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 you know, feeding a sentence and getting this image that I really love and then trying to find a model in the clothes and copying it. it just, well, in that way, it becomes yeah. a conceptual sort of like time-based, process-based right. media. And it's almost like having a ghostwriter or a plagiarist right. that you're allowed to plagiarize. Right. In a way, that's the way I'm looking at it. When I create an image, I think, you know, I could also just give my own mind that sentence and paint it, but having this, this incredible software or technology that completes that image beyond what I could have thought of is that which I would like to copy and work from, but then I wouldn't want to necessarily give credit to it. I'd be like, no, I just painted that. So, I mean, in a way, I, I would like to leave it where it is, but that's where we differ, of course, is that with painting, I can't, I mean, I could, but I wouldn't print out an AI-generated mm -hmm. image and what, do a couple dots on it and call it a painting. It's just not, I mean, I probably should. 
what do well, you I, think I should do? I think, <laughs> yes, I mean, I think, I think in your case, if you're painting, I mean, I would have to do a very elaborate setup, but I think if you wanted to paint one, it seems like, you know, but or paint them. lose the part of it that's so abject and bizarre, which is the part where it's so, which I want to get to, which I find is something that is necessary in your work, it seems, is that approximation of life that's almost lifelike, but doesn't quite make it too convincing. And I think that's a much more interesting place than something that is absolutely perfectly convincing. So the things that are that I couldn't necessarily copy into a painting or take with me from AI into a painting are the exact things that are the most interesting about it. It's the quality of it. Whereas, yeah, I could paint things that already are approximating a person or a thing, but the difference there between that uneasy dystopian sort of um, all to like to the hyper real part of the AI is the, the thing. Plato's and, cave, the uncanny valley, yes. all of this, you know. But in photography, you can bring that with you and that is the work. Whereas in a painting, it's already going through too many iterations to keep the uncanniness of the AI. So I would just, right. it would just be yeah. lost. It would just be a weird, bad, funny painting that wouldn't do I, it. Yes. I mean, so we, you're lucky you can use it. I can use it, and we know. I mean, the comments on, on my Instagram feed from people who are fearful of it and think it's the end of art. I mean, I heard all of this when there was the Museum of Holography in Soho in the 1980s. People were like, this is the end. <laughs> we're at the end. <laughs> art is over. And that's what, you know, that's what, um, this is a medium, it's there, if we want to use it, it's going to get really bad, it's going to do evil things, we know it, we know um, that many things have that potential, but it isn't yet, and I'm not, I, I can't, I don't see rejecting it, I can't find a way to reject it and not find it really fascinating and it's interesting. It's a fun game also, it's such a fun game thing to play with and to actually, it, it almost feels like, I mean, what I imagine playing online chess or solitaire would be like. I mean, you're, you are having a dialogue or you say something, something gets said or shown back to you. That's much more interesting to me than most of the things I do on my phone. So I would never reject it either. And I don't find it to be immediately scary or imposing a threat to art. I think that humans adapt to technology. What might have looked really realistic in terms of a scary sci-fi movie in the 80s is something that we obviously see as, as um, hilariously right. out of date now. So I think we'll be able to adapt to understanding, seeing the nuances within that image production. And so in a few years, what we make now, we will look back on retro, ret yes. as, as nostalgic yes. and retro. Yes, that's a good point. I mean, there are scary moments. Um, for some reason, I'm really drawn to doing portraits of myself with my, my colleague, Penny. So when I put in a prompt and say, Laurie and Penny, I, I won't give all the secrets to my prompts that make it be, you know, make it look like my work, but when I say, Laurie and Penny are going for a walk down Valley Road, the images that come up look too much like Valley Road, like too much like the road that I walk on every day. And I'm, I'm sort of wondering like, where are they getting this from? Ooh, it'd be I fun don't... to make a horror movie where it's like her, in the sense that the there's a there's a sentience to the oh well, free movie idea. I'm saying there might be. Maybe there That's is. <laughs> yeah, it's also advertising the thing I just googled. It's yeah. like showing me um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like cat piss remover on my while advertising to me something that mm -hmm. I want, and it's also following me down Valley Road. Valley Road? No, I'm not gonna say. Which road? Well, okay, but mostly because it's funny because it's an uncanny valley road, or did I make yeah. that up? Okay, go on. No, it is. Um, oh, I can ask you one now. Yes. Um, okay. Well, that's a quarter. Okay, I was reading some um, Barthes earlier, and I have two different quotes for you that I wanted to hear your take on, but I'll start with the first one. Um, Barthes speaks of Japan and Empire of Signs, and he says, on Tokyo. Tokyo offers this precious paradox. It, it does possess a center, but the center is empty. The entire city turns around a site both forbidden and indifferent, a residence concealed beneath foliage, protected by moats, inhabited by an emperor who is never seen. I love that, but I see that description as bearing a similarity to Kirigumi, which I know... Kigurumi. Kigurumi, my god. It's okay, it's hard. It's okay. <laughs> no one knows how to pronounce it. I don't want to be like, insensitive, but... Um, 
I see a similarity there, which I also see as an interesting um, um, place that you've mined for um, imagery that is similar but different to that of the vacuousness of beautification in the Western world as well. And so when talking of you know, something revolving around a center that is empty and being concealed under, it's such a, beautifully, a beautiful description of a city, but I think you can sort of imagine a bunch of these characters walking through it, and then you could see the comparison in a Western setting. And I wonder if um, turning to Japanese imagery is a way, are you through that imagery exploring more Western or American themes? Because I find, for example, Baudrillard's writing on America is more descriptively succinct and interesting than an American writing on America. Yeah, so sometimes looking at it from a from an dis outside, distanced. Yeah. yeah, and I find that to be true of a lot of art historians who look at the United States from outside. And it is, it is easier to sort of um, get, well, rather than say that, I, I do wanna say when I went to Japan for the first time, it was like, whoa, I'm home. You know, you walk down the street in Japan, there's so much artifice, there's so much sort of, um, um, it's a very, how can I say this? without sounding offensive, because I don't mean it this way, but it's a very infantilized culture. So I would be walking down the street and you know, the center of Tokyo, which is a place that any morning you could wake me up and say I have a ticket and I would go. That's how I feel about it, like get me back there. But the first time I went, I'd be walking down the street and I realized that there were little like um, Pac-Man characters above me on everyone was going <laughs> like all these noises of like um, little, um, anime characters and squeaky voices and tiny things and you could go into stores where there were thousands and thousands of miniature objects on keychains and just so much stuff and it was all fake and it just it it just I thought there's material for me here for the rest of my life but even what you're describing it's a scale difference and the style difference but it's not that same description can be attributed to walking around some parts of America and part, some of the worst parts, and they've done it in a way that feels it's different and, and there's an aesthetic, uh, a, a more pleasant, I think, uh, enjoyment to be found from the stuffness of Japan or Korean culture, but um, it is a parallel I think you can draw to Western culture. We have so much stuff in America. We have so much little stuff you can put on a keychain or like throw away right after whatever it might be but the stuffness is parallel yet different and it, I find it an interesting way to examine um, the um, what the pro problematizing American consumer stuffness like the yeah. toys and plastic stuff of it all through the through a different um, physical space but there do you does when you work through that when you use that or mind that imagery in your work do you think, I mean, I don't think you're making a criticism of Japanese culture. Not at all. Do you think Not of it as, Amer as American? Well, I think that I came of age, you know, um, anyone who's seen The Graduate knows when Dustin Hoffman graduates, everybody says plastics. That's the future, it's plastic. Mm -hmm. And I felt like when I started making pictures, I just felt like plastic is my marble. I moved the light and it, it I mean, it was, I was so, enamored of plastic and that's really how else could you sum up the early part of my life what I was born into there was no um, nobody was repulsed by it nobody understood what would be floating around in the ocean years you know years in the future no it was just this magical substance and everything was made out of it and if you had dishes made of plastic and clothes made of plastic fibers that was considered wonderful and there was a real beauty to it. There really was. Um, so I think that maybe when I maybe when I got to Japan, it seemed like everything was done, in, you know, done so well, and there was a kind of abundance and a kind of um, it seemed like a very clear vision of the way things should be of a different kind of world. Um, and Japan is an island, and it's there's. I mean, the the only thing the Japanese have, according to my research, that's that's their own or the hot springs under the island, but they're the best, like I've had some of the best Italian food I've ever had in Tokyo mm -hmm. when I really craved Italian food. And I remember one of the times I was there, the, the, the French maids in the pastry shops were in, in fashion. 
and it was some of the best French pastries. So their, their ability to mimic and imitate is something that I really admire, how they do that culturally. And the kigurumi that Chloe was mentioning are, um, and I don't know, you know, trends change there so quickly, but there were people that were wearing um, these huge masks um, that look like, kind of like anime, and I, I don't have any of the pictures here, but you could see through the eye holes, you were dressed up as your character, you could see vaguely through the eye holes. I've worn one of the masks, I don't like wearing it. But you needed to be led around, like you would go to shopping malls and restaurants wearing your character. And it was really interesting to think about um, boys and girls and um, you know, mixing up their genders and becoming more gender fluid by adopting these characters. I'm sorry there are no pictures here because it's, uh, it's, hard, it's hard to imagine, but imagine a person with a very big head that um, has, <laughs> <laughs> that fits over your head, that has like anime features. Well, the equivalency in American culture, although I'm sure it probably started somewhere else and expands elsewhere is plushy and furry culture, like the mascots. Yes, but I think that, that that's yes, fetishized. Absolutely. I first came across that when I was maybe nine and it was on maybe MTV or something. Mm -hmm. And you know, it never left my mind. And <laughs> it's just an interesting, um, it's, it, it, it proliferates into so many different, whether it goes into sports or it goes into a more sexualized way. There always, of course, and all through, throughout time and cultures will be different ways of um, of, of assuaging the impulse to be someone else yeah. and putting on a mask is not a new thing and it isn't only ki ki kigur kigurumi. kigurumi, why do I want to say kirigumi? Kigurumi and it isn't only plushy and furry culture or many other kinds of cosplay but it also is a logical conclusion of a desire that we all have and an activity that we all participate in which is just the small and ever expanding steps we take in order to modify, alter, improve, or change in other ways our appearance or our self, which brings me to the work that I really wanted to discuss, which will be back soon, which is how we see. Mm -hmm. That was the first of your work that I came into contact with, also at Salon 94, when I had just moved here. Mm -hmm. And I, um, it stuck with me, and I came to know your work backwards because that was the first I saw of it, which is, um, it's, a, it's a later body of work. Once you had worked through doll houses and then real dolls and then doll head, I mean doll head adjacent mm -hmm. um, um, costumes, you find yourself using uh, or meshing these two, combining these two, the real and the doll, like the organic and the synthetic in a way that is not as clear cut and doesn't fold as neatly into one category or the other with this series, How We See, where, as I'm sure you know, but it's these beautiful portraits where the eyes are painted on. Mm -hmm. And for me, that work is really interesting because it is such a small amount of the photograph that is um, intervened upon. But that intervention, that replication of something lifelike but not quite convincing, not, it's not a pair of contacts that change realistically someone's eye color, but it's a much more uh, almost abject um, like almost misunderstanding of the assignment of makeup mm -hmm. to take it that far to paint one's eyes on. And what is so beautiful to me, I think, is the moment of calculating optically the optical illusion, the trompe l'oeil, of whether you can make eye contact with... That was the whole thing. Right, because you're Should being... Be, yeah. uh, you, the assumption is to make eye contact with the subject, but of course the subject is unable to use their eyes. But then you also, all paintings are unable to look back at you, but at least you can sort of live in that illusion. And so my question, when I think about that work, I think right away of makeup, beauty alterations or modifications and the sort of um, the sadness, but also the celebratory nature of those technologies or of cosmetic and makeup in general, the idea, and this is a perfect image to bring up because this kind of replicates yeah, a bit right. of that before right. and after sort of idea, but, um, on one hand, there's something very sad about a world where the expectations of beauty and standards for women are so increasingly, you know, um, harder and harder to meet, or the amount of um, bodily alteration that women want to do or are asked to do in order to meet the standards of um, and more and more deeply darkening perfection is 
you know, obviously sad. And so the idea that, and then if you expand that, the idea of needing protection and um, armor against a world that is so threatening is sad. But at the same time, there's a way of looking at it where there's something to be exalted or celebrated about novelty and technology in ways that you can protect yourself from that world or advance and, or, or improve the way you feel about how you appear or whatever it might be. And so my question, sorry, is um, I suppose when you look at that work or when you're creating that work, are you warning against a future or condemning in a way a world that makes women and others need to prepare um, protect themselves in such a way? Or are you celebrating the idea of advances in, in self-modification that allow people to do what they want with themselves, or, or neither of those? I think neither. I okay. mean, I think, <laughs> cool. I think that it, that's a really, um, that's, a more, that's a more literal interpretation of the place that I would go. And I think that what happened was, again, Thank God for the internet, or I wouldn't still be making work. I think it was part, you know, came from a phase of, you know, one of my um, YouTube rabbit holes where I just was watching makeup tutorials, and a number of them were by young Asian women who were really, you know, they had sped up um, painting of painting on anime eyes, like these big eyes that they could do right over their eyes. It was so beautiful, and I take <laughs> this is. I take really gr great pride in the fact that none of my ideas are my own. Like everything that I find, I find somewhere else and then I, I grab it and um, it goes through the system. It goes through the lorry system and it, it comes out. But I love that, I, that it wasn't my, you know, I'm certainly not the first person that's ever painted um, eyes on, a, on someone's closed eye or that I, I saw, um, a YouTube video, I found it by accident, of a woman walking down the street in painted, I'm sure a lot of people saw this, in painted on blue jeans. And the whole point of the video was to see how many people realized she was naked. And I just watched it over and over and over and I thought, it's painting, it's a woman, it's got everything. <laughs> and that's when I started um, doing the Some New series where I painted um, clothes on you know, my, my children and the picture of Andriana Campbell has a painted on necklace, but um, I feel like I'm just, like I'm reiterating, I know it doesn't sound as deep as any of the stuff that you posited, but I feel like I'm reiterating a moment that I see, and it's, it's on me to show you what's going on right now. This is what I see. You know? That's so funny because my third option was, or is this more of an anthropological journalist sort of neutrality? And is, it, is there an indifference in, in that, in the face of these things that could be read as so sad or so dangerous? If it were to be, I know that would be quite didactic if you were to say, and it's a dangerous world if you are to continue down this technological path. And I don't suppose you're saying that, but is the, is I it then a more, say those of course not. Yeah, no, but, but, but artists do, you know? Sure. But I, so then is this, because I was picking up in a way a neutrality, not of an ambivalent sort, but more of an, almost in a journalistic or in a dignified way where the women that are painted on, that's such a great one, or the eyes that are painted on are not shown as an oddity like if you picked somebody who involves themselves in a, in a subculture on the internet and you recreated it and we're saying, look how weird this is. I don't, I don't see it as you um, showcasing something as though it's an oddity, but rather it's quite dignified and also taken for granted almost as though it's a, as though, you know, it's a technology, as though face filters or a hat or some mm -hmm. sort of, or a corset or some other body altering thing that's introduced and as it's introduced is novel, but then becomes as accepted mm -hmm as any other alteration, so it feels almost as journalistically positioned. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a journalist, I'm not an anthropologist, You're and neither are you. Um, I'm, wait, what if I become an anthropologist? Do you want to? Yeah, I think that art is, in a, in a way, anthrop it can be anthropological. Yeah, I think it can. I think it's a snapshot of a pseudo. moment. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, I think in the end, we're artists, and what we do, um, I think it's still up for grabs what artists really do. I think that the, the longer I do it, the less I understand 
why I would have chosen this life. <laughs> but then again, I feel like I didn't have a choice mm. because I was so busy with those brown and black <laughs> crayons and my parents told me I was an artist. And right. It's the only time I ever listened to them. <laughs> and I kind of wish I hadn't sometimes. So I could have tried some, something else. Like but, what? Um, well, I know, I know it's close, but I, would have, I think I would have loved to make, now that I'm the age that I am and I have so many, so much physical work, I think it would be great to only make movies so that you just had a row of, a row of DVDs in your house. This is a storage <laughs> problem? Maybe? Yeah, it's, it's a storage problem. <laughs> it's a storage problem. It's a, yeah. Um, and I always wanted to be an actor, but I felt like I was too shy. But it's so interesting because so many actors want to be artists. Mm -hmm. So, you know, grass Maybe is always greener. you could be an actor who then becomes an artist again, and you can be a born-again artist in, yeah. that, in that way. That's a, that's a good idea. I like the idea of a born-again artist. But, but it is really hard to understand what we do, why we do it, why people continue to do it, what function it serves. I mean, these are questions that you would think at my age you would get used to being an artist and stop asking these questions, but I ask them more now. They're great questions. Why would we do this? Mm -hmm. That's crazy. And there are, I'm sure a lot of you in the audience asking yourself the same question. They're asking themselves, why do they do that? Which brings me to, are we supposed to in, let people... Yeah, yeah. Okay, could... Are you ready for questions from... Oh, yeah. I have, more, I have so many more if you guys don't have questions, but... <laughs> Does anyone? I think they want, they want probably want your questions, but... They're shy. Yeah, okay, so I'll, I have more questions for you. <laughs> um, do you collect art? And if so, does the art that you collect have any relation to your own work? Does it complement it? Is it in opposition to it? Or does it, does it look good together? Or yeah. What do you collect? Um, well, we trade, we've traded over the years with a lot of our friends, which is really great. But I have my own little, in the hallway of the house we live in, I have my own little art collection of photographs, and they all look real, oh, so much like my work. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, my, that's the part I'm allowed to curate. But, um, you know, I'm married to an artist who really loves art and really sort of drives a lot of the things that we get. And a lot of them are are artists that are more obscure, people you wouldn't know about, shows um, that my husband partner might walk into and just decide that he wants to own something. I mean, it's really a luxury, it's really a luxury to collect art, and I really feel grateful that I'm able to, should I ask you for a trade, can we yeah, trade? Yeah, we're, yeah, absolutely, that's the next, that's, all, that's obviously. Yeah. We that's have what to, we, well, we talked about that, we yeah. could do something that's, well, I think there's so much of our work that would A, look really nice next to each other, and B, is in dialogue in a way mm -hmm. that it's, it's becoming very clear to me, and if it wasn't already, but um, I think we are interested in very similar imagery in different ways. Of course, painting and photography. I think I make painting that deals with photography, and I think you make photography that deals with painting. Absolutely. Um, so and yeah, we're gonna trade. Um, and yeah. what about you? Do you collect art? Uh, I'm starting to, I do trades as well. Um, and yeah, I have a little bit of a collection, but of course, um, I live in my studio, it's a live work, so what ends up happening is that the more work I have and the larger and larger it gets, and it can be quite large and there can be quite a lot of it, it bleeds into the room that was supposed to be kept for other people's art and then it sort of is almost like I'm being a bully in a group show where I'm like, here's a really big painting of mine next to the work I've collected and the work I am collecting does accidentally interact with mine, which it's is why it's funny that you say I the same. I think that I'm drawn to things, you know, where there's a, where there are i um, definitely drawn to images that I feel like um, connect to mine in a certain way. Yeah, I have a lot of figuration. I have a lot of nude women, a lot of boobs and butts and faces, mm -hmm. a lot. And right. so it just recurs where it seems to just, it's not on purpose, but it seemed to be drawn to something that replicates what I'm interested in. And it's just as I suspected, you too. Right, <laughs> very much so. Um, so I have a few more questions that would be more like when we were having dinner and into our second glass of wine or something. Um, okay, do you have imposter syndrome? That's such a great uh, question. Yeah, um, I go through periods where I don't and those are amazing, incredible moments and I'm, I'm currently having one right now. Up and here on this, 
up here? Just in, well, yeah, but I'll, no, more in general in, um, yeah, and I think when I first moved to New York in my explorations of what should I do, and then I let it go and it became really fun and then I kind of zoomed through some really fun and unthinking, unself-doubting years and that's great and I hope for those again and now I'm thinking again. And I hate when this happens. <laughs> well, you <laughs> do assume other soon. characters as well in your work, which is something that I admire. You do that pretty unselfconsciously when you become Aunt Sheila. And well, I think that's what I'm not self-conscious about and I'm self-conscious about or have an imposter syndrome about not doing that. <laughs> like, I feel really at ease being way too much or um, taking on characters or being loud and annoying and effusive and theatrical in my work slash life and so the imposter syndrome only comes in when I feel as though I should be not doing that. It's not like I have stage fright. I have fright of not being on stage. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm safe here but if and when I descend the tiny staircase I'll be very scared again. Well you'll have backlash tomorrow which you know when you're up on a stage and you do this sort of thing then the next day we'll you get mad. Hmm? Backlash? Like people are going to get mad? No, no. Backlash <laughs> is when you're angry at yourself and oh. you say... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have yeah. that one a lot. It's yeah, fine. So. But I, I mean, but in, a, in a terms of the present or... Um, yeah, I, I have imposter syndrome about being not uh, like loud and effusive. I have no problem being Sheila. That's way more comfortable Sheila, to me. Sheila, for people who don't know, is this character that Chloe assumes that looks like um, the aunt that you would hope you only see once every year, if that much. <laughs> um, overbearing, right? Yeah. Annoying. Yeah, but kind of cute. She's cute, yeah. She's very cute. She has a Too thing. much makeup. Yeah, it's a... Too blonde hair. I don't, even, I don't even know how to define her because I didn't write her. It just happened. Yeah. And then I was intending to make a video for some film uh, compilation um, that um, my friends at what was Red Bull Studios, but now is not, uh, were doing online. And I was like, oh God, I have to make this video. I should probably write some stuff. And I don't know how to write that kind of thing. I'll just put on the, and then I put on the wig and the makeup and the nails. And then I started recording and suddenly 20 minutes had gone by and I had just monologued. And I, I was having the greatest time. I tried, to, I was like, how will I do two whole minutes? I don't know what I'm gonna say. And then suddenly, and then 20 minutes had gone by and I was like, that's Some, acting, by the way. That's acting, baby. That's showbiz. <laughs> that's showbiz. But it just felt so, so natural. And then I'm like, am I allowed to make, is this art? Am I allowed to do that? But it turns out, I, apparently, yeah, mm -hmm. I think so. But that's what I'm comfortable with. Mm -hmm. That's what I like. Yeah. Sounds mm -hmm. like you're also, you kind of wanted to do acting, and I sort of, maybe we should ditch the questions yeah. and just do a little... Go to Hollywood. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're out of here. Okay, I have a few more just questions I would ask you if we were just... Okay. When you're my age, do you imagine you'll be open to young artists or terrified of them? As, as, as what, as friends or as art, their art or? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen both. Um, do I imagine I'll be open or I'll be open. I'll be pro judgmental probably and be like, I did that first. And then I'll probably be like, come here and be friends with them. Cause I'm probably gonna. Well, there is this, this one. It's a complex set of steps, but I know it's going to be that it's way. It's a complex set of steps, and you know, the thing you often hear from an older artist is looking at a younger artist's work, it's like, oh, I did that in graduate school. Right. And, you know, such an eye roll, but it's very, I've just, over the course of time. But you did well, do that in graduate school. Did I go to graduate school? No, you probably did do that thing that you're referring to when you're seeing young artists' work as, you probably did do it before then. Well, I don't, I don't really think of it that way, but, um, I know that. Um, I think you're just ahead of the. I think you've always been ahead of the curve, and I think a lot in of. In terms of. In terms of using, like, a, you're talking about technology in a way that's not techy, but, but it's. I'm a, talking about more but of an attitude, yeah, like a, yeah. more, more of an idea. Um, I'm already defending you yeah, so no, that my think, self in the future. I think you may be, be an older artist who I'm like, says, well, <laughs> who says uh, I did that in graduate school, but I remember um, a really long time ago when I was first in New York, I. Um, sat for an Alex Katz painting with two of my friends wow. and he was so interested in our work and so and he went to see every show and honestly I just heard that he went to see my show at 56 Henry I think he's still out there seeing every show he possibly he can. He is right but he didn't see mine did he? Did he see mine? That's cool amazing. It's That's amazing. awesome. But at that point I made a decision I thought I mean there are many ways I do not want to be like Alex Katz but that aspect of constantly being 
open to what's new and open to what younger people do. It impressed me so much. And I was very young at the time, and I thought, I want to be that. I want to be that person. That's a beautiful And it's not always easy, to be. you know, because it is much easier to say, oh, I did that in graduate school, or that's crap, or, you know, boring, or I hate this new technology, or, you know. I think it'll be important to probably be open to stuff so that you don't get killed by the AI or generating like weaponry they're going to be making those kids of the future. <laughs> I'm like, oh. Exactly. Um, another, oh, um, what it'll, oh, how do you pronounce Marina Bramovic's last name? <laughs> a, a I don't know, so that's why oh, I would why, ask why, I'm, 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 I'm not how Serbian. How do you pronounce her last name? A, a Bra Vich? Abramovic? Vich? Does anyone know? Abramovic? Paul? I don't know. Are you just reading your Google searches? <laughs> like, uh, yes. You're down to that. Okay. Um, do you, um, that's my Google search. Um, do you see psychics and tarot readers? And no. You don't do that? No. Should I? Uh, I wouldn't tell you to, but. Would your tarot readers say I should? Do you? I do. Look at your. Are you? Are you going to read my? You're, re, you're wearing this your beautiful friend, puppets and puppets. Yeah, suit your, your friend covered in suit. cards. Um, so you don't do that. You don't. You don't. Not yet. You would have started already. <laughs> would I? Or I feel like it's something you get to at like 38. I started when I was 21. 38, Rob. Yeah. They're like it's true. It's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Do you? Yes. Okay. And how's that experience been? For all these years, great. Oh, wow. When did you start? At when I was 21. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah, and there were a bunch of psychics in the hotel and Sonia, and I'd just gotten out of um, art school. And I went to see this woman, and I just moved to New York. Actually, it was probably 21 or 22, and her name was Reverend Woodbury. They were all had, all the psychics had Reverend before their name, and she kept saying, honey, join the camera club. Join the camera club. Whoa. You'll meet people. And then she said, Get a good agent. Picasso had a very good agent. I thought, what is she talking about? Oh. Um, so I think it's interesting at that point that I had zero do you ever, interest. Do you have her number? Reverend She's what? so long dead. <laughs> this woman what is very... so long dead. But I think it's interesting Find that me with she a Ouija board then. kept reiterating <laughs> that I should join the camera club, and I had no intention That's crazy. of ever picking up a camera at that point. So I'm open-minded to being open-minded to that. OK. So I would consider it. Um, it's definitely, you know, some of us do and some of us don't. But I wanted, was curious if you did. I'm not anti. I just don't really have, I haven't had time to, to or I haven't been upset enough mm -hmm. about something that I couldn't just figure out the answer to or the cause of, like that I would need a magic eight ball to tell me. At the same time, I don't, I have a, I'm very open-minded to a lot of paranormal or uh, parallel universe fate related kinds of uh, bullshit, but I haven't ascribed to one enough to need to pay a person to tell me to, you know, it take depends a different how path. desperate you are to know right. what the future holds. I think but I could definitely see some desperation in my future, which would allow me to, yeah. or which would in, which would encourage me to go see a, re a reverend. Okay. As a, a, I am Jewish, though. So. Yeah, the reverend and, thing was. So I think that. We really need a question from the audience. Well, I have so a lot of look, 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 look. I don't look. I finally. <laughs> Hi, Tiff. As you know, I do take photos to then paint from. So there is a practice of photography in my painting practice. Um, I think what I exhibit the the photographed form maybe in a printmaking capacity, but I wouldn't like pride myself on my photos. I only look at them as a as a way of getting to the to the painting. But would you paint? Never. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely never. I don't know how to um, you there. One of the questions I was going to sort of ask you. Oh. I don't know if I'm. I'm I, I don't know if I'm uh, allowed to give advice on. What would I know? You you would know. It's. Advice, I just, I always say that you have to find a community of friends and artists. Like, that's the most important thing, I think, is to have your network um, of fellow, you know, fellow artists, fellow creators. That, that seems to me like the way to start. And then you end up naturally trading information. And if one of you has an opportunity, then you share the opportunity. I mean, that's, 
that's what it felt like. I assume that's what it still feels like. And it's one great thing about, you know, the world of being online is that communities can form when you're in disparate places. Yeah, that's probably what I would say as well, where I've already, I've, I've heard that when I sort of moved to New York and started exhibiting, even exhibiting in ways that, you know, felt like I was being done a favor to just be included in this like group show here or there. But what really resulted from those things that felt, you know, am I getting anywhere with this, was friendships that ended up being, I mean, like I'm imagining a bunch of people holding hands and then everyone lifts everyone else up, but it's truly what ends up happening. Well, it's not, a, it's not a strategy, I would say, because strategy always backfires, is my experience. Yeah, I didn't know what was happening when it was happening. Yeah, I was sort of like, I would oh say that. boy, look at all this art, and I was just making stuff naturally, and I think back to that as the most pure, and, um, and creative, and I, I don't even, I really don't like the word creative, but I mean generative or productive in a pure way, was when I first moved here and I started making stuff that I didn't know if anybody would ever see, and I was excited, but I didn't even realize that there was a reality in a career, or that there would ever, I didn't see a future, I didn't think deeply, I think that's a, a strength that I had, was that I didn't imagine a career yeah, or strategize, just kind of went forward with, making stuff freely and making friends that were doing the same and followed my interests, just followed them. And at a certain point, I just woke up and I was like, I'm allowed to do this as a job? That's so cool. But I think that this, the availability of, um, you know, knowing everything about uh, the market or artists' careers or people's lives through the way we have so much information now, I'm, now I'm sounding like I'm back in my day, but this is, I'm talking about 10 years ago. There was information, but I wasn't seeking it out in such a degree. And so I was allowed to just focus, and I think that that's important. Whereas I think what's dangerous now is you can look around and see what everyone else is doing, and then you can compare yourself, which I think. Yeah, there's always a new way to feel bad. Yeah, remember that. You just have to make stuff to show mm -hmm. stuff, so just make stuff. Yeah. Okay. Oh my gosh, we have a lot. Oh, I think back there was really asking. Oh, it depends on Great the. Question. It depends on the size and the. Scale and the subject matter, but it can take a day or it can take a week. But I paint, when I'm painting, it's, it's for many, many hours and it's relentless, really, really fast. And so it's a lot of hours, but it's only a few days because I have hyperfocus disorder. Sorry, I, yeah, a big one. Could be a week, it could be, it just depends. Um, but if, I, something is, if something is just coming so naturally and the subject matter is, providing me with ease because I'm so excited by it and it's just working. It can go so fast and I can like <sighs> step back and go, oh my God, I just did that in a t couple days. That's cool. Maybe I should say it takes two, it takes two months actually. Oh. <laughs> um, back in the back. Um, you want to go first? Who no. influenced your practice? Um, um, Ryan Tricartan, um, when I first came into contact with um, his video work, um, IB area and works like that in 2004 or five. It was before YouTube. Um, so that kind of imagery and that availability was not so commonly come across and it, it blew my mind and it showed me something I will never unsee. And so that really, and that really influenced a lot of my work in the video realm. Um, Pierre et Gilles, which is, which is, oh I wonder God, if you, amazing. Yeah, I feel like that's a, we should have them here with us. We, we probably connect that's, on that. Yeah, that's amazing. I carry so around that. this giant Pierre Gilles book that a, a friend of a friend left at my place, or maybe I stole in high school, and I've carried it, I've had it for 15 years, and it's tattered, and I have hilarious, like, sketches I did from art school, like, in different parts that's of amazing. it. That's amazing. I absolutely, I'm sorry to say this, because I never like to do it. I absolutely could not stomach that work. Oh, I thought you were going to say, like, really? No. Oh, my God. I thought, like, I thought I you were like, that. oh, I love I Pierre Gilles. I have come to appreciate it tremendously. Oh, oh, but when I first time. saw it, I thought, no. No. That's so funny. That's so, well, that's hilarious because, oh, okay, I wonder, so what was the no? Was it cringe because it had a similarity that you didn't want to be? cringe worthy is a good word, yeah. Was it because it had a similarity that you didn't want there to be? Or yes, is it that, probably, which yeah. I think is... Yeah where that usually it's like you're seeing your evil twin or yeah you know. yeah um i think well there's you can't i can't remove or um extract the the timeliness because i'm seeing it in the 2000s yeah, right. and it was made in the 80s right. so for me it was so beautiful but i'm sure it was perceived as a certain way at the time but i love that and then um alice neal 
um, but like Sargent, Titian, I don't know. Um, and, the, and, and Egon Schiele was, uh, was big for me when I was a, a baby. Mm -hmm. That's four? That was a lot. Oh, OK, thanks. <laughs> so now you can only give three, because I okay. gave five, so. Um, God, there's so many. Let's start, in, let's go in the Wayback Machine. Walter Keene, but we know those paintings were really made by Margaret Keene, if you saw Big Eyes. So that's when, you know, that's when I was a kid at home and I just, my parents got me a print. I'm sure it was really cheap, but it, I still have the frame print. And then um, Deborah Turbeville in the, from the fashion world really got me to pick up a camera. Rodchenko, Man Ray, there are so many. My husband, Carol Dunham's work has influenced me more than he really realizes, although my work has influenced him more <laughs> than his work has influenced me. Who has influenced him more? Okay, I've influenced him more, but his work has influenced me a lot. Okay, so almost as much, but not as much. And you know, my, my peers, my contemporaries, Sarah Charlesworth, Cindy Sherman, um, they're Louise Lawler, so I, I still have so much admiration with, for my peers and my friends, and they're constantly keeping me on my, on my toes. So that's, that's a lot more, but the influences change over, you know, it could be, you know, my own art, because I've been making it for so long, goes in and out of fashion with me. Like, there'll be a series that I just can't stand, and then five years later, I think it's the best thing I ever did. And it's so true with artists' work. It, looking at another artist's work, it does go in and out of style with you, personally, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I just think of what, what, when the word influence is used, what made me what allowed me to open a door. Well, that's why I was brought up Keen. Yeah, and I think actually for me, I used to work for Brad Trammell, and I think that really opened a lot of mental doors, mm -hmm. which, I, which maybe some should be closed, but it was a really um, formative way of looking at what, what could be art. Um, question? Yeah? We, only, we have time for only just two more. Okay, oh, rock, paper, scissors. The, so, the, you have to pick up. Okay, well, I said her already, yeah. I love the way, I, yeah, I love that question, and I love the way picture, well, it's interesting, talking about Alex Katz, I remember when I was, we had to go several times to sit for the painting, and he talked about other artists and the pictures they made, other painters, really famous painters. Oh, he made some nice pictures, and his pictures, and um, he used to paint, he said he used to paint, but he, you know, he, he, he hung out his shingle, but he took it back, and like, he had such a, a sort of, like, um, beatnik way of talking about art, and I think that um, that I'm always looking for the least pretentious way to talk about things, and even as a teacher, you know, when I, the point when I was teaching, when everybody started using the word practice for what they did, I thought I was going to really lose it. My <laughs> father was a dentist, he had a little office in our house, he had a practice, he had a dental <laughs> practice. We're making art, this is not a practice. Um, and I, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but it's, but you know, some of these terms that emerge give a kind of, um, th th there's a kind of heaviness or a kind of pretension that I feel doesn't do any of us any good, really, in the end. So I rebel against your teachers who are telling you you're not allowed to say picture. Yeah, I kind of want to know which word is the most or least pretentious here because I don't even realize what I'm saying, obviously, I don't really realize what I'm saying. But when I think about, did I call a sculpture an image? In a way, that's interesting. <laughs> With the, also referencing the TV, right. which is an image. I'm of gonna start calling my work all slides. <laughs> um, but even, even like, but a sculpture like could calling, be calling a painting a picture. I love that. I think I thought that was so cool when he did it, and obviously, it, you know, stuck with me. Yeah, I mean, I think it's. I guess it would maybe be about which part of the thing you're referring to. Whether it's when I, I guess when I say image, I'm not only talking about my painting, but I'm what I'm portraying as well and the, you know, what is being shown, the message, verbal or, or visual, is, the, is an image. It's like the message being shown to you, what it, the content. But the paint, if I'm talking about, like, don't drop that painting, I wouldn't be like, don't drop that image. <laughs> like, I feel, so I guess, I, I guess, I don't know, I don't really think about it very much, but I'm not sure if, I guess, maybe I should start calling my sculptures images. That's so cool sounding. I like that. It's unpretentious, and, but it's wrong. It's wrong. <laughs> it's wrong. Um, and then the last question. Well, 
when I first kind of came to the, I was in paintings, I was in school for both time-based media and critical theory and also painting. And I came to New York being like, as much as I love painting, I probably, it looks like I shouldn't really do figuration. And also I know that I'm gonna be really good because I have a skill, but I'm 22 and I haven't honed it. So the paintings I'm gonna show are gonna be, and I had a series that was quite um, like purposefully unserious called Literally Me, where I did funny, really quick paintings of myself in, in a day and stood next to the, it, uh, but I was trying to use like, you know, a copy and printing and, and the dissemination of images as though it was online and trying to be, conce well, I mean, it was conceptual. I actually think it was a great work that I'm like, good, good job, 21 year old me. But um, I was trying to circumvent just truly painting because it felt vulnerable and out of style or an impossibility. And I love truly painting. And I also needed to spend like the 10,000 hours, and I still do, to keep on developing that language as a fluid, natural way of expressing. And uh, whether it goes in and out of style or when it goes out of style, like, which is probably like really soon, I care so much about color and developing form and articulating volume. I love it, like sensually, so I can't not do it. But I also am aware of you know, the waxing and waning of what's in, in conversation. And for a few years, I just tuned it out and I was painting and I was given an opportunity, luckily to, you know, show my work and it was going well. So I just tuned out, you know, anything that was, that would have suggested that painting was dead. So I just kept painting. And now I'm having a bit of a moment where I'm like, wait, there's so, I don't know, like I have so much that my work, I, I believe, intends to discuss or dialogue I'd like to bring up or ideas or concepts I'd like to mine and I'm not sure if painting allows for a deeper sort of more holistic exploration of those ideas or the true funniness of it all or the absurdity in my mind of what I'm interested in because painting has become so, I don't want to say painting has become so popular or popularized because of course it's like the most popular medium and has been but I think figurative female painting is getting a bit of like a, becoming a kind of a neat little category with its own associations. And I fear that there's a negation or an erasure of my more multimedia work. Perhaps the more I align myself with that work, this is, you don't need to hear me. This is my, I'm, I'm, my insecurities and stuff. But I'm just, I'm thinking about what painting can do and what it stops short of doing if it might invite a lot of vis visual looking and you know um, ex exaltation or support of beauty and uh, congratulations or it's a celebration of physical like look how nice that looks but if it stops there because for whatever reason it has tended to or it it would be enough if it did then i don't know if i'm doing enough to um feel understood or doing enough to really reach into all the places in my weird brain to show and make what I need to show and make. But I wish I could clone myself and then I could just paint all the time. I love that. And then make video and sculpture. Sorry, that's, that's my imposter syndrome. I have to say before we go that your titles are so good. Thank you. Chloe's titles are, just get her catalog and just, before you look at the work, just go through and read every <laughs> title. They're fantastic. Thank you. I really appreciate that because I love language. Me too, but I'm anti title in a way. So. Are you anti title? Let's not go off God. on a whole other. Okay, but the, let's go. That's for dinner. dinner. That's okay. for dinner. Yeah. Um, thank you guys so much for yeah. listening. I'm, that was so fun. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>